Okay, here we go, y'all. <laughs> uh, that felt like a good grounding for me. Um, I really appreciate that, Chris, and, and all that you do and have done for this organization. Um, yeah, we're going to dive right into our panel. For those keeping track of time, we're going to uh, going to be a little bit shorter than we planned just the whole time um, and, and keep up with our pace for the day. But, you know, time is an illusion, so that's okay. We'll still uh, get to a whole lot today. Um, we have an amazing panel here. Um, I'm inspired by all the organizations and folks that are um, joining us for this panel today. Um, the panel's about mutual aid as it strengthens Atlanta's abolitionist organizing. And part of the impetus for this was me uh, being in community with folks and seeing the fact that some of the folks at, at the core of abolitionist organizing in Atlanta are also doing so much mutual aid organizing and me noticing how those things are speaking to each other. Um, these are connections that the folks that are on this panel today have long made. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to hear more for them uh, today about their journey, journey in organizing. So I'm gonna quickly read through their names and what their organizations are just so we can jump it off. And uh, I'll start with the first question. And um, yeah, just for the panelists, for the first question, you will go ahead and um, all of you will answer it just so that we know what your organization does and the needs that you met, meet. And then for the rest of the questions, you know, we can kind of popcorn. So we have Sunny here from Soul Underground. I'm really excited. Soul Underground is one of our new member organizations. They were also a BCEF grantee last year. Um, we have Brittany here from ARC Southeast. Uh, you know, Brittany is um, involved in a lot of reproductive care work and is also a doula. Really excited that Brittany can join us. We have Kwame here from Community Movement Builders. Kwame was actually also at an NEC call last June talking about abolitionist organizing in the city. So really great to have you back. Dayu's here from the In Defense of Black Lives Atlanta Coalition, who has been holding down so much organizing around Stop Cop City and just um, abolitionist organizing since 2020 in the city. So really great to have you here, Dayu. And PJ's here from Mariposas Rebeldes that does both mutual aid organizing and abolition, abolitionist organizing as well. Um, so really excited to have you here. I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question just so we can jump it off. And I'm going to ask um, Kwame to answer first, and then um, I can kind of call on y'all as we go through. So um, the question is, introduce the work that your organization does along with the need or issue that you are trying to address. And if you could do this part quickly, that'll be really great. <laughs> Peace, everybody. Um, so yeah, so my name is Kwame. Um, I organize with Community Movement Builders. We are a Black radical organization. Um, we organize based off of the praxis of the liberated zone theory, the idea that Black folks, African folks in um, our community should have complete control and autonomy over every institution that touches our lives, right? So really har harpening in on uh, self-determination. Um, and of course, uh, that ties directly with um, abolitionist organizing because one of those uh, uh, one of those institutions that we need to have control over within our communities is any kind of safety apparatus within our communities. We do not believe in policing as being a, a appropriate safety apparatus, and so we also have to create what safety looks like within our communities um, absent of policing. Um, and so, yeah, so. Um, the way that actually looks like, and that was kind of like a lot of theory and jargon and whatnot, but um, the way that a lot of that actually looks like is we are organizing focuses on two uh, core things, right? Um, one is gentrification, or I'll say three things. One is gentrification, um, two is um, policing and police brutality and abolition, police abolition, and then three is while we're building up to these log longer term and larger um, projects, we also have to make sure that we're building up institutions to be able to create create uh, meeting people's immediate needs um, as they are right now, right? So to that point, um, it's, it's, necess it's necessary that we have things such as uh, what we have called liberation programs, where we do food distributions, um, cleaning supplies, um, hygiene items for Black folks within the liberated zone and also slightly outside as well. 
Um, and we, you know, we organize with a uh, housing working group directly with uh, folks in community to be able to build autonomy and power within the neighborhood around housing and gentrification. And we're very involved with the cop city movement as well. I'm trying not to take, much, take too much time. <laughs> no big deal. Y'all are doing lots of work that we love to hear about. Um, let's go to Brittany next. Let's talk about your organization and the issues and needs that y'all are addressing. Okay, hey y'all. Uh, my name is Brittany. I use UNA pronouns. I am uh, the organizing and outreach manager at ARC Southeast, which stands for Access Reproductive Care Southeast. Um, and what we do is in the name, we are a reproductive justice organization that um, centers and uh, ensure, tries to ensure the access uh, of Southerners, specifically um, Black folks in the Southeast, uh, making sure that they have access to abortion care. Uh, we do that. We have a primary uh, health line, which does our abortion funding, as well as practical support, making sure folks have um, accommodations, their travel accommodations um, secured. Um, so hotels, um, bus tickets, plane tickets, depending on where folks are having to travel to to access abortion care uh, based on their gestational age and um, the, the various laws that are in our inside of our region. Um, we also have our organizing and outreach arm, which handles most of the programming. So we have um, an emotional support group for folks who have had abortions, who have sought abortions in the past. Um, we also do some direct mutual aid work uh, with those set of folks. And we are um, in the beginning stages of um, doing some like targeted leadership development for the folks who have um, supported our programming, support folks who have, um, I guess, gone through the health line to seek abortion care, um, to get some more RJ leadership out into the community. Um, happy to be here. Yeah, I know y'all also have a really dope, like free plan B distribution program and a whole bunch of other stuff that we can get into later. <laughs> um, yeah, let's pass it over to Thayu from In Defense of Black Lives Atlanta Coalition. What needs are y'all addressing and what's your organization like? Hi, y'all. I'm, Th I'm Thayu Luhamer with In Defense of Black Lives Atlanta, IDBL. Uh, we do a lot of, we're a coalition of organizations and we, most of our work focuses on um, training up new organizers and community members who want to get involved. We hold a lot of um, coalition space. So as moments like Stop Cop City pop up or the 2020 um, George Floyd uprisings pop up, we're often holding that coalition space and holding space of like different organizations of people coming together saying that this for this moment they want to work together towards achieving whatever the current goal is so we hold coalition space for that so let's train up new organizers and new people and doing a lot of like fellowships and things of that sort to get youth involved and get them um knowledgeable about what abolition is what abolitionist organizing looks like and how they may want to plug in using their particular skill set to um, move abolition forward within the city of Atlanta. So that often looks like um, within like holding coalition space for people, it often looks like holding the resources for coalitions and moving the resources to where they need to go for a particular moment. And that's uh, a lot of the work we do and that and within that, like within holding that work, it looks different each time we do it. So what we did in 2020 looks very different from what we're doing now with Stop Cop City, which I'm sure we'll get a little bit into later. Thank you for that. Let's go over to PJ from Mariposas Rebeldes. Hello, my name is PJ. Um, I am a core organizer of Mariposas Rebeldes. And uh, the roots of our organization began for the need of accessibility for the queer and trans, indigenous and black community for, to access to land and food without having to pay for it. Um, most of the people in our community do not have access to our ancestral homelands, as well as being displaced from our culture for generations and in our lives in this generation being displaced from housing, experiencing food insecurity. Um, so our goal and our work is creating a community network, an ongoing community network where we can obtain resources and make trades and support from each other without um, having money involved, as well as um, we have a land project that I am a land steward of, um, where we offer uh, or we bring a uh, community green space where we 
celebrate food and each other and reconnecting to our cultures and um, our indigenous identities that we have been displaced from. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. And last but certainly not least, Sunny from Soul Underground, take it away. Hey all, my name is Sunny. I use they, them pronouns. Um, Soul Underground, or we just say Soul, is an ecosystem of abolitionists in Atlanta dedicated to Black and Indigenous resistance and liberation. Um, our goal overall is to construct alternatives to state oppression and anchor them in like non-hierarchical practices that help marginalized communities like self-manage their evolving needs. Um, right now, the work we do a lot off, around um, is building power amongst unhoused folks and building solidarity between working class and unhoused communities because there's a lot of um, a lot of great organizers on the streets that people don't really take the time to get to know. There's a lot of powerful communities who are self-organizing and have been self-organizing for a while. So we just were led by them and we are just in community with them, help move the resources. Um, yeah, so that's that's it. Yeah, awesome. And Sunny was at our Black Atlanta Solidarity Economy gathering. Brittany was there, Kwame was there, <laughs> Nai was there. It was it was really awesome uh, earlier this year. So, you know, I'm sure folks are wondering kind of what's in the water here, right? And we want to make sure that folks are aware of the current cultural and political realities of Atlanta. So, um, you know, like help us construct an image and a story of, you know, what's in the waters that your organizations are navigating right now in Atlanta. And whoever wants to go first can please share. I can tap in um, from the RJ standpoint. So our big thing, I'll speak about Atlanta specifically, is um, our six week ban in Georgia. So abortion in Georgia is legal up to six weeks or um, upon detection of a fetal cardiac activity. Um, six weeks, if you're not familiar with how pregnancy and things work like that, it's like you might recognize you've missed your period inside of week five. Um, so you have to then, you know, get an appointment, do all the things, um, and, and that's super hard for a lot of people. There is also like huge maternal mortality issue in Georgia, like one of the one of the worst um, states in America to have a child, have a family. Um, and the tenets of reproductive justice are the right to have a child, the right to not have a child, uh, the right to raise a family in uh, safe and healthy communities without fear of um, intimidation or violence from the state and the rights of bodily autonomy. So our work um, is is essentially trying to secure that uh, for folks, uh, help so folks uh, secure that for themselves in the midst of the barriers that are being uh, put up by the state and not necessarily engaging with the state to ask them, you know, to, to let us be in RJ, but yeah, taking it for ourselves. I can go next if it's the same question. Um, the reason I jumped in is because I actually got a message this morning. So the biggest thing or biggest hurdle that we deal with in our work is over-policing um, of Black unhoused folks uh, because they're a very visible population, especially in Atlanta. And we got word this morning that there will be probably more police sweeps on the specific street that we've been like building community with for the past three plus years. Um, and they're a really resilient community. I will say in the time I've known them, this is probably the 13th or 14th time that they've been swept. Um, we started tracking it, but it's really hard to track it because we can't find out about it unless we have inside knowledge and we rarely ever get it. So this morning was kind of different because like now we know, but we don't know when. Um, and that's honestly the biggest hurdle in trying to help folks organize because when you're displaced, you lose everything. They throw away all your stuff, your phone. There are people who I actually saw a person that I haven't seen in like almost a year because she just had no way to contact us and she'd just like been around, didn't want to go back to the same place. So 
Um, it's very heavily tied into anti-policing work and abolitionist work because they make it impossible. And then also with gentrification, we're seeing more folks on the street, more folks not being able to get off the street. So that's what we're, that's what's in the water right now. I'm gonna hop in next and build off what y'all just said, because I feel like, you know, we all in the same waters, just in different parts of the water. Um, and from what In Defense of Black Lives is pushing forward and doing within the Stop Cop City work, the, the same things are in the water, the over-policing, and when Brittany, you spoke on the um, like the lack of autonomy that people have over their own bodies, and just like that's even seen within the communities around the forest, um, like people don't have the autonomy not only over their bodies but over their spaces. So that's forcing people to move in like ways that are compromising to their own integrity. And what a lot of like when we do political education and we do getting into the community and talking to people and building people up and getting communities prepared to to potentially have a wave of increased police violence coming into their spaces um and so like that's what's that's what's currently in the waters that like there's a there's a wave coming and we're trying to protect people through like building um like building spaces and building things that like help protect and shelter our people both like physically and like um in other ways metaphorically and such because it's the waters are it like the police violence and things are like very abundant in the waters but we also know that there's more coming and it's not like it's not like the waters are getting cleaner they're getting dirtier currently in atlanta both with the police violence and gentrification also which is like all time all stop cops cop cities adding to all of these issues at the same time and I can piggyback off of that too. Um, I think everything that I thought you said was, uh, you know, spot on. And I also want to speak about the um, also state repression of protest at this stage um, in Atlanta in particular is extremely high. Um, you have a mayor that is um, intentionally trying to cover up a lot of the police repression that's been going on within the within the movement. Um, I don't know how much folks on this call have been following it, but you've had everything from uh, one protester who was murdered by a coalition of police forces. Um, and I say co coalition, that's everything from the local APD to the DeKalb County to Fulton County to um, Georgia State Police to Homeland Security and FBI, right? So every level of policing um, has been tapped in to suppress this movement. Um, uh culminating in you know the murder of Tortuguita but also um extremely thin um thinly veiled repression tactics as far as like trying uh giving people domestic terrorism charges giving people felt um for things as 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 it's like holding up a sign that says stop cop city defend the Atlanta forest right you have folks being criminalized for posting uh or putting a flyer on a mailbox and getting felony charges for things like that. We have people that have been, uh, after a protest, being kettled and hunted down and body slammed by police officers um, <clears throat> um, in very violent ways being and being arrested. Some of times uh, for no, uh, oftentimes for like the, the charges are just missed later because there's nothing that actually uh, could stick. You have, um, our infrastructure for movement work being attacked through uh, our solidarity fund that has uh, offered bail support for a lot of different um, folks in movement spaces being um, raided on charges so thin, even the judge said that I hope to the prosecutors, I hope you have more than this because you can't actually prosecute anybody based off of these charges, right? So very intentional, very um, extreme uh suppression of the movement and um so i think that's in the waters and then one other thing i, I want to say just to bring it back to community specifically the rampant gentrification that we are seeing um ties directly within the policing um that we're seeing within our communities as well and the narrative that the that the state is trying to craft where we're seeing um incidences of violence being um one 
blamed on a lack of policing, blamed on our communities, and then also a, a very blatant lack of response from the state, from policing, from EMS to incidences of violence, which on our end, and when we have, when we talk to folks in community that, you know, who've had, who might have been relatives of folks that have been victims of that violence, um, it's very clear to them that the solutions cannot be coming from the state or from policing, that the solutions are coming from um, building community and building long-term institutions that can be able to provide resources and make sure that our uh, communities can be safe in ways that actually keep us safe, not ways that uh, further police us. Um, so um, that's, I think, um, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, recognition within our community groups that policing is not the way that we're going to actually uh, liberate ourselves or, or even just on the baseline, keep ourselves safe. Ashe, yeah. Um, Y'all named a lot of things that are happening externally to movement. And I just wanted to chime in and name something that's happening internally, which is the tension between like grassroots and national organizations that's in the water too, right? And trying to navigate some of those things through a mass mobilization moment in a decentralized movement that is intentionally not um, trying to consolidate power into any one organization, right? So there's that happening too, and a tension among strategies as well um, that's at play kind of both within the Stop Cop City movement and more broadly that's been happening over the last three years. So I just want to throw that in there of like, yeah, there's the external tensions to our movement and there's also the internal things going on as well. Um, and of course they're connected. I did want to pitch the next question just because, you know, I want to make sure we have time for members to ask questions as well. Um, so all of your organizations are involved in abolitionist organizing, as well as small, strong mutual aid programs. Why do you feel like it's necessary to do these things together? And what are the ways that those projects work in tandem? And what are things that make it difficult to piece them together? I know there's a couple questions there. Feel free to choose which one you want to tackle. <laughs> I'll hop in first because um, I feel like um, what you said about the national versus the local organization organizations the tension there. There also happens to be a tension in Atlanta between like Stop Cop City organizing and the organizing that's been happening for a long time within Atlanta and will continue to happen for a long time. Seeing that like Stop Cop City is a um, is a moment, and there's many other organizations. So when you say when you ask what um why are mutual aid and abolitionist organizing inherently connected? And um, dang, I forgot the last what was the last part of the question you asked. Uh, why do you feel like it's necessary to do those things together? What are ways that those projects work in tandem, and what are things that make it difficult to piece them together? Something that makes it difficult for the Stop Cop City movement is it's a lot of outside people coming into Atlanta or to push forward the Stop Cop City movement. Uh, and it's a lot of people who are not already doing a mutual aid work within Atlanta. So that's something that's made it difficult within the within the Stop Cop City sphere to do mutual aid organizing. Yet at the same time, it's also been a way for us to plug the people who are new to movement, who have been activated by the idea of Stop Cop City into mutual aid organizing through like we through like regular distributions and uh, mutual aid events and things like that but it definitely um just because it's it's um it's stop cops in the moment so it's kind of taken away from some of the other regular organizing that's been happening and we're hoping or in defense of black lives is working towards pushing that into pushing that work into the larger mutual aid infrastructure that's been building in the city for a very long time yeah, I want to ask about something you said. So why, just like 30 seconds, why would people coming in to the city just like make it difficult to be doing mutual aid organizing? It doesn't make it difficult. Not that they make it difficult, just people who don't have like a long time presence in the city don't um, have the connection towards mutual aid right off the get go. That's something that's kind of like built over time by connecting with communities because um, mutual aid and charity are like two different things. Yeah. I actually interviewed a comrade recently and they were talking about how um, people often come to Atlanta to see what they can get from Atlanta, but not necessarily with the lens of what they can lend to Atlanta or um, what's going to be invested here. So that's an interesting thing that you're naming. Yeah. What are other people thinking about this? Why it's necessary to connect mutual aid to abolitionist organizing? Um, I'd love to jump in. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, uh, Something that I was thinking about, like mutual aid, is um, 
at least within the community that um, I have been working with, um, I am like a land steward, although I do not know much about like land restoration. And part of like mutual aid can also be like people's perspective and people's experience and people's um, knowledge that they have about things that maybe other people don't have. Um, and something that we practice in our group is called El Cambalache. And um, that is a practice that we learned from um, the Cambalacheras in um, San Cristobal, Mexico. Um, they are a woman-led um, indigenous organization that practices like um, no money trade. And the thing is like valuing that everyone in the community has something to offer. Um, even if it doesn't come to mind like what they can offer initially. And when you take money out of the picture and we start a conversation on each other's needs, then over time we can develop and get to know each other more and what the community needs and work towards those goals. Um, something that happened on our land recently, um, we have a creek that directly comes off of the South River. Um, and uh with climate change um and the dysregulation of um utilities in atlanta our creek was polluted by a broken sewer and our collective had absolutely no knowledge of what to do about this issue um and uh it affected our green space it affected the um our ability to water our land and to um, provide like for our trees and for the animal life that depend on this creek. So we were able to reach out to other people who knew more about it, um, uh, like the South River Watershed Alliance. And um, like, and so I guess like, what I'm trying to say is like, what is important with like community and mutual aid is like, even if someone seems like they might not have something to bring, I think like getting to know each other and getting and expressing each other's needs um, will help us realize that we have more that we can offer each other than we are led to believe and to then depend on money itself. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that. Sunny, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say that for us, um, like mutual aid and abolition and organizing work go hand in hand because what we've learned along the way is that we can't expect people to show up as organizers, activists, anything. If their needs aren't being met, it's actually an unfair thing to ask of people to extend their time for a movement that isn't also taking care of them. So that's why like we approach everything with mutual aid first, because we know that like sharing food, sharing a meal, chit-chatting on a Friday leads to the strong connections we need to have in order to have a movement. Um, and for us, it's worked, I mean, I don't want to say amazingly because it sounds weird to kind of quantify it like that, but it's worked for us because we've been able to build lasting relationships with people who don't have like a lasting place to live. Like I can be anywhere in the city. I could be out of the perimeter because I've seen people in like Sandy Springs before. And they're like, oh, Sunny, hey, how have you been? And these are folks that I know from living like downtown and things like that. And then folks are just able to show up as their best self. And for me, like the lowest barrier to entry for mutual aid is always food. If I'm doing something or if I'm, you know, meeting new people, it'll almost always be like food centered because I want everyone's stomach to be full so that we can then talk for six hours about what we want to do. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, this came up in our um, Stop Cop City Coalition as well. Um, folks were expressing some disinterest in some of the political debates that we were having specifically around how to move democracy in a decentralized way um, because they were like, yeah, I literally don't know where I'm going to live. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, different folks, there's different money moving in and out of the Stop Cop City movement and things like that, right? So when folks are seeing that, 
it's like, oh, this is difficult to kind of comprehend um, how how folks who are organizing around this are also experiencing housing insecurity and a whole bunch of other needs. So definitely hear that. And thank you for uplifting that because I think as folks have been canvassing around Stop Cop City, they've also been kind of hearing those same messages of would love to be involved, but also I need my needs met and I can't be involved otherwise. Um, I did want to go to the next question. I think after that we can open up to uh, the members for questions. Um, yeah, so what are the impacts on our abolitionist movements that you've seen or experienced when care work is sustained and centered? So basically, how has mutual aid affected the abolitionist organizing that you're doing? I can definitely hop in here. Um, similarly to what Sonny has been saying and, and others, um, when you provide care for folks, when you make space for folks to show up fully, uh, which is how I contextualize uh, care, it allows folks to show up. So, you know, if you have um, child care from specific and intentional, you know, people who are, are trained um, and you let people know, okay, well, now I can come and I can bring my kids because so that was going to be a barrier for me. If you um, make sure that folks have a way to get there, all of our events, we offer folks Uber, you know, gift cards or whatever the case to make sure that they are able to come here, do the thing and get back home. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it enables people to show up and it enables people to show up fully. And then folks are like, well, yeah, this is great. And I want to get involved. Like, how can I, you know, I'd love to do childcare next time, or I'd love to, you know, um, just, yeah, allowing people to show up as themselves, be in space with one another and, you know, see what's going on that's what it's all about like that's that's that power building like oh yeah this is happening oh my god this is amazing i never even knew i'd love to i'd love to so yeah so um i, I can um also talk a little bit about that too um and i, I want to start talking about that about uh kind of like an example um of it's kind of two parallel examples that um just been happening very recently that when I read read and I heard this question I I thought you know this is a perfect example of this um so on the south side of Atlanta um there have been a series of you know just shootings that have been taking place um one on Heritage Station which is a the largest apartment complex in, Pitt, in Pittsburgh Atlanta which is a neighborhood in which we organize in um you know there was a, it was several kids really that were killed at in this in this particular shooting um and for that one in particular you know it was on the news you know a lot of folks were um you know the, the police had a specific narrative that they were talking about with this shooting and you could probably all guess what that narrative was about how you know the gangs are out of control and all these different types of things um and, um, but, you know, when we actually sat and talked to um, folks that live in that plaza and folks that actually, uh, and, you know, I was actually, I, I was there, I lived in the neighborhood too. I was there when we, when the, um, you know, after, and after it took place and we actually saw, and from a community response of like, so it, so, you know, there was a lot of things that the, that a lot of these kids might have actually not have been murdered because the police left their bodies out for like hours, right? Um, all these different, and, um, you know, there was um, a lot of questions about the police's narrative about what was actually taking place, even down to who all was involved with the actual activity and um, a lot of these different types, and, and a lot of these different types of questions. And then the police's narrative and even the apartment's uh, narrative as to like how they were handling the incident was very much so based off of further criminalizing folks in the neighborhood right, or in an apartment complex. How we approach the situation in our organizing is, you know, for the past uh, uh, several weeks, we've been doing a lot of intentional canvassing in the community and actually just seeing what folks needed and how folks wanted to, how folks can react to this, how folks are reacting to the situation, how we can actually come with solutions to this. And what we're invariably hearing is one, folks want, a town hall where we folks can one get together, have conversation, heal, and um, you know do some of that care and 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 community care type of work with each other. 
and then two program um, and also you know at that same town hall having resources for therapists because a lot of the kids that knew some of the kids that were um murdered at that time and um you know and also the parents are scared for their children as well and just make, and having these intentional spaces to be able to work through that but then also how do we actually develop uh programming and intentional uh things that can just and can prevent this from happening in the future right so this is the response that we're hearing from folks in community right this is the response that we ha hear when we're actually doing our organizing work and we're centering not like giving people a solution to the problem but actually centering the care that is needed to be able to create community solutions with our for the problem right and so again this town hall hasn't happened yet we're still collecting information doing canvassing and all on all on all of this um and simultaneously actually trying to create or understand what actually happened outside of what the police's narrative is because there's a lot of questions about what the police's narrative is at this at this time too and so we've we, I strongly think that, you know, when we have this town hall and we have these next steps, even after that, we're going to be able to come up with some actually actual solution oriented, um, you know, uh, next steps, as opposed to what the state has already said is like, they're going to be having more police trolls in the community when we already have police coming, driving through all the time. Right. So I think that's just a, that when I read that question, that was an, an example that I thought, it directly ties into care work, centering the folk, centering people that have been impacted, and then also, um, and even coming from them that this it has a very strong abolitionist stance as to like this, the solutions that we're looking for don't have anything to do with policing. And what actually is keeping us safe is our, our community response to being able to build this. Can yeah. I, can I hop in next? Yeah, 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 please. I really wanted to go off what you just said, Kwame, because you're talking about like, um, I feel like in the in defense of Black Lives, the work we've been pushing within Stop Cop City, we have like two aspects of care. And you're talking about like the community care part of it. And I, I wanted to name like the communities around the, in Southeast Atlanta that are around the forest that's um, being proposed as a site of Stop Cop City. They are, um, they're the dumping grounds of a lot of Atlanta. There's their communities could be inconsistent. They're, they're over-policed, right? And they're also used as like a dumping ground to get the landfill directly upstream from the site. And literally, as I've been going and canvassing and people have been going and canvassing, one day I'll drive back past and it's just like a, you know, a nice clean forest, a nice clean street. The next day I'll drive past and there's a bunch of trash on the side of the road because somebody from somebody from, from somewhere else came and dumped the trash there within the community. Right. And considering that like, oh, it's illegal dumping, right? So the police are supposed to be stopping this is like considering the idea that policing would come in and fix that issue it's obvious that police are not caring about that issue or caring about um the community's well-being or other people that be dumping their trash and their waste within this black community is um like that's not a, a valid solution so what we've done we've done community cleanup days where people will go out and clean up the trash that is in the community that is in the community as a way of giving back to the community and so i feel like that's one piece of like care that's been happening with abolitionist work saying that like we can clean up for ourselves, our own communities, and we don't need the police or the state to come and clean it up for us. We don't have to wait on them. They're actually the ones who are dumping the trash and creating these landfills in our in Black communities. Then secondly, another piece of care work that's been happening is that the organizers, us ourselves, Black organizers, not only need space within movements, as IDBL has been holding that like coalition space, but also need care work within this space and chances to um to a hill uh, on an individual and on a communal level. So we've like hosted like as far as like programming goes, as uh, care days where organizers and people who are plugged into the movement can come and receive care work from practitioners, um, such as like uh, I know Matulu Shakur recently passed. I'd like to like give major thanks to him as a as a major care worker and somebody who like pushed that forward and created the practice of um, NADA, which was something that we we've had for um some of our organizers in the past so that's like a, a big piece of care work too and you know got to name the ancestors and the people who did it first because we don't always make these things of ourselves often we're following traditions from the past too yeah i definitely want to um pivot so that we can open up space for members um everyone who's here including staff members if you have any questions you can either um drop them in the chat samara will lift them up for us 
or you can go ahead and come off mute and voice them into the space yourself. So what questions do y'all have for our wonderful panel today? All right, hey y'all, this is Amara. Um, we have a question here from Emily. Um, and I'll just read it out. I'm curious if there have been moments slash examples of success in continuing to keep those who have been displaced involved in organizing efforts. Are there ways to stay in touch and weave in participation beyond the long beyond the long term structural solutions? How how can we counter the ways gentrification ties into erasure and weakens place based organizing? Um, I would love to speak on that. Um, in our group, um, something that we had uh, struggled with that we had to stop and acknowledge was um, a hierarchical structure. Um, and at the top of it was um, like uh, indigenous gatekeeping, um, like what indigenous people look like and what indigenous practices look like and who is considered indigenous and who is not. Um, and we had to do uh, some work um, within ourselves and um, we had a festival coming up and we canceled that festival to address the harm that had been done in the group and the people that were affected. And um, with how we have been moving like this and not working on it, it has affected um, our work for the our work towards liberation for our own community and even for ourselves. Um, uh, Samara, could you ask the question one more time? Yeah, um, I think the question is centering around um, you know keeping those that have been displaced involved in organizing efforts, how to move them into participating. So while going through these struggles, two of our members have actually been um, displaced twice this year in housing, as well as two of our members are still displaced and have not, um, have been bouncing from house to house uh, for about two months now. Um, and as well as working through um, the harm that has been brought up in our organization. So what we've had to do is instead of like focusing so much on the work is to focus on each other and on each other's needs and um, listening to each other and asking each other more often like what we need because some of us in the group are actively displaced, have active food insecurity. Um, and how we continue organizing is remembering like even though people who are displaced like have a lot like going on like in their bodies and processing a lot of trauma. Um, they still like displaced people still have ideas and still have dreams and still have um, access to resources and concepts that can move us forward with our goals. And I think like often um, displaced people are um, infantized or considered that they don't have anything to bring to an organizing table because they are struggling with housing or food or money. So I think how we have done it in our group um, is commit continuing and committed to communication and asking each other's needs and helping support each other with our dreams until we can get into a stable place. Thank you for that. We can go to Sunny, I think you unmuted, and then uh, Kwame. Yeah, I will keep it brief with a few examples. Um, we've been able to like have success in stopping police sweeps last summer. Some before that, we have prevented folks from being displaced, although it ultimately will happen um, because the cops come at like four in the morning and we, it, it's a long story. Um, but I think for us, like the best example of continuing to keep folks involved in organizing is that we're consistent. No matter what happens, we will be 
at the corner, 48 MLK Drive, every other Friday from 7 to 10 p.m. during the summers. And like folks know, even if they're swept, even if, you know, they haven't been downtown in years or months that we will be there. We've not missed a Friday in like a year and a half. Um, and if we do miss a Friday, something crazy must have happened and we will be there the Saturday. And during the winter, if it's too cold to be outside, we will be there like, cause we do an overnight warming station, but folks like don't know the temperature and we have like, a, it's a whole thing, but folks know that we'll be there. They know where to find us. If they can't, they know how to contact us because we're always making sure that we're keeping the connections. Um, and that's just been the best way to keep folks involved because they also know that eventually like our biggest goal is to get people into housing and it doesn't matter if we have to move 20 mountains, we're going to make it happen however we can and just showing up for people like that. Yeah, um, I think. Yeah, plus one to everything that uh, Sonny just said. I think that that uh, consistency is extremely important. The only other thing I would add um, that's specific for us, Pittsburgh, uh, which is the neighborhood that we organize in on south and on the south side of Atlanta, um, it's heavily is being heavily gentrified right now, right? Um, and so there's been several people who have been very um, strong organizers or or very consistent organizers who have you know they had to they their rent got passed where they could pay for it and they had to move or their section eight was no longer valid or or whatever it was that took place um but to that same point i think part of what and some several of those folks who might have stepped out also come back to organize with us as well even if they've had to be moved from uh, their particular location they still recognize the work and want to contribute to um you know the projects that we have and um, the, and I think the reasons for that are twofold. One, I think it's extremely important that when we're building, when we're organizing, organizations first and foremost is about building relationships, right? It's so building authentic relationships and building those authentic relationships with people um, makes it so that people don't see this as like something that is just external to them, but it's something that they're a part of, right? And so having that makes people want to still participate even if they necessarily aren't in the particular neighborhood that we're organizing within but then and then the second piece of that is also making sure that you have your organization is structured in a way that can also support folks um in the needs to be able to and make it so that they are able to participate right so we talked about some how the mutual aid piece um connects to that with like you know and i think a lot of people think of mutual aid is just like food distributions and those types of things. But what that also is, is I think other folks have mentioned this as well, is making sure that we have childcare every uh, every meeting that we have, making sure that we have the ability to go and pick people up if they need a ride, if they um, can't catch MARTA or um, don't, and don't, have a, uh, don't have a vehicle, like making sure we're getting people, making it easy for people to be able to plug into the work that we're doing so that folks can still tap in even, um, you know, if they're no longer in the specific community that we're in. Um, and also having the will to be able to continue working, working, organizing with us as well. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, we have, I think, two questions left in here, and I think we can get to both if we are deep and concise. Um, so uh, I see Samara is going to ask uh, Carol's question next. Uh, yeah, Carol asks, what has been the biggest impact slash benefits to working within the NEC? and collaborating with other groups. So for groups that are not part of the uh, NEC, like what, what is like coalition building or like being part of a network done for your organization and the work that you're doing? I can briefly read what I, I replied with uh, in the chat, um, but it's been great to have the connections and access we do a bi-weekly free store. Um, so every second, well, first, second, and fourth Friday. And 
uh, we were able to expand actually, because we were only doing it the second and fourth Friday. But last December, we got a grant from the Black Solidarity Economy Fund. So we were able to expand it to a different part of the city. And this is the first time that we've had a free store not in our usual location in like two years because it's helped us increase capacity, gather more supplies and cook more food. And also we've been able to meet some really cool folks like through the calls that New Economy Coalition has. Um, and working with like other groups, even outside of NEC, it just, it, I think for us, we're like eight folks with very limited capacity because we all work like 40 plus hours a week, you know, um, and being able to like be in community and throw events and do things with other folks just helps to build our capacity and reach more people who are like our specific followers are very niche. Um, and so being able to reach other people's like base has been really great because then we get to meet more people and ever expand our network. Thank you, Sunny. Yeah. Um, if anybody else has a answer to that, I can just move on to the next question um, here. That's, um, and Jasmine, I see you. So we'll, we'll try and get to you uh, after this one question here around um, specifically to Brittany, um, Suparna says, I was very moved by how you explained the connections between reproductive justice, abolition, and liberation, um, and goes into some of the work that Suparna does. And I'm wondering if you have ways in which you see the connections between re reproductive justice and climate and food and land justice play out in the powerful work you're stewarding, stewarding sorry. Um, and if you can share some of that with us. Absolutely. And thank you so much for the question. I think um, it all really ties back to that question of safety. Um, reproductive justice says that we all have the right to raise families however we see fit and safe and uh, supportive, healthy communities. Um, and that includes uh, safety against famine, safety against hunger, safety against poverty, uh, safety against displacement, right? So I I see huge connections. I think that, well, let me say this, 80% or 80, 80 plus percent of the folks who call our Southeast do identify as low, count, low income, have little to no medical insurance, are living in an uh, underdeveloped, currently gentrifying or in a rural area and are black. So inside of ensuring that our families are able to thrive and be successful, um, we need to make sure that we are holding and creating space for folks who are doing the work of raising families. We are making sure that folks um, are not living in, uh, in food deserts, for example, or in uh, hospital deserts, like the folks who live in Southwest Atlanta, you know, where they, they just closed the hospital. We have the one, one trauma center down in the city that has, you know, 13 and 14 hour uh, wait times in the emergency room, right? So these are these are the things um, just ensuring that we as community are doing what we can to remove those barriers um, and reminding ourselves and reminding uh, the folks who we support who are in community with us that like these are, are things that can be accomplished with our own hands and in our own time like without without needing support from the state hopefully that answered your question i'm happy to talk more about it later too yeah, that was great. Uh, thank you, Brittany. Um, and so we're going to take our last question here from Jasmine, and then we're going to move to a close. Go ahead, Jasmine, you can take yourself off mute. Thank you, guys. I just want to say thank you all for the work that you're doing. Um, I, I have a lot of lived experience with, with this, this work. And also, um, I used to live in Atlanta when I was in high school. Um, but I guess my question is, is how can we create systems of mutual aid that allow people to get their needs met while maintaining their like autonomy and like dignity because a lot of the problems that have been named in the system that we currently live in are money problems you know if people had the money to pay their rent or had the money to um, buy the things that they needed they they wouldn't be in that situation i know that for me personally it's been mutual aid of my community and grassroots organizations, like providing actual money. I've been on the receiving end and the giving end 
um, that has that really does change people's lives and allow them to be able to show up. So I guess my question is, how can we create systems where people are able to receive that and not feel like shame or guilt or, you know, judgment within the community for needing, wanting help, asking for help and receiving help, whether it be money, food, housing or otherwise? Okay, yeah, I would love to speak to that very quickly. Um, I think, well, so a little bit of context. ARC Southeast is a smaller organization. I think we have like 15 people on staff. We do have a larger budget as uh, a nonprofit who funds abortion for like the, the whole Southeast and uh, some other folks, some other regions that we have uh, solidarity with. Um, and something I'm pushing against all the time um, is complexity in your application processes, um, in your outward, like whatever language you're using in your outward communications for folks and making sure that like the services that you do offer, the, the support that you are able to offer for folks um, is like well publicized, like letting people know what you have going on um, and big, 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 uh, emphasis on like coming off of those dollars. Like I've had to consistently be like, hey y'all, we need to let go of these monies. Like we're a nonprofit, meaning we have to be at zero at the end of the year. Like, what are y'all talking about saving for? What are we talking about? You know, like there, there is no, none of that. We need to save, <laughs> save the sanity of our community by, by coming up off these dollars and uh, letting people know that this is, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's, yes. Yeah, so making sure that we understand as organizations operating inside the nonprofit industrial complex, this is not our money. Uh, the community is the people that this organization is for, you know what I'm saying? Like if, if there is no community, there is no us. Like we need to be working ourselves out of a job and not, not trying to stay, you know, stay paid forever. Like, no, making sure the community's needs are met first and foremost needs to be the priority. Yeah, Sunny and Kwame take us away. And then we'll wrap up. Sure, Kwame, you can go before me if you'd like. Um, okay, yeah, I'll keep this very, very brief. I think that um, one of the things I think is extremely important is making sure that, like for for our for our liberation program, which is our is one of our um, kind of mutual aid uh, type of uh, organ, uh, you know uh, institutions that we're building, um, we start, and that's where we distribute groceries, cleaning supplies, hygiene items, and whatnot. We start each of these sessions by doing um, political education and our organization is very rooted within political education. Um, and I think that part of what we, um, to kind of address like any kind of, so, so for example, like our last li uh, liberation program, um, we focused really heavily on a distinction between charity and mutual aid. And then we also focused in on like what? Why are we building? And what what systems are making this a requirement? Right? Like what 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 systems are are being built in? That are we existing within that make it so that our needs are not met? And framing this as a way of collective resistance against those systems. Um, it's not the only way of resistance, but it's an important part of the that resistance against these systems. And so. Um, the hope with that is to dilute any type of the shame shame aspect of it because it's not it's not anybody's fault that this that folks are are needing these items it's uh does is by design that uh, there is a poor and working class group of people right um and so um really hype harpening in on the political education aspect of uh, that is embedded with and with all of our programs, not just our mutual aid work, but all of our programs. I think is a really important aspect of this work. Yeah, and we keep it pretty simple. Uh, like you said in the chat, Jasmine, we just trust that people know their own needs, and we don't police them in the way that they like want to come take things because far less people like abuse mutual aid than I think folks think. Um, and if there's ever a time where someone like wants to take everything we have on the table, we'll just, and it's mostly, usually I'll just be like, Hey, you know, feel free to take what you need. And then they, I don't know, if something happens, they like 
we'll reassess or whatever. And yeah, whatever happens, happens. Like we said about like fiscally conserving things, like my job is not to hoard all the snacks and make sure that everyone gets one single bag of chips. Like I trust that people know how much food they want, how much clothes they need and all the things. And also another thing that I think is important is just empowering people to know that they can be picky. I think that's something we run into a lot. People are like, I'll just take whatever you have. And I'm like, but do you like, do you like this? Like, you don't have to take it just because we're giving it away. Like you're welcome to bring stuff you don't want anymore and take stuff you do actually want. You can even like request things. And I think like, as our relationships have grown with people, they've like built the understanding that we're not the folks that you can't like say like, I, these clothes are ugly. Like, could you like, I don't know, find something else or like this thing isn't working for me just the same way that it would be with like friends. Like that's, we're not going for that kind of like giver and receiver relationship. We're going with like, I talk to you, like I talk to the homies I grew up with and the same way I would be like, this is ugly. I don't want it. If they like, I wouldn't say that. That's kind of mean, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, that's not really my taste. Like you could say that because we're friends or the end goal is that we're friends. And thank you for the question. I really like it. Thank you. Um, Y'all kill the cop in your head, abandon the scarcity mindset, um, embrace abolitionist organizing and mutual aid. Can we like come off mute and thank our wonderful panelists if you can? Um, just want to say thank you so much for coming and sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us and I'm kind of proud. bringing it all into Atlanta. So yeah, come off mute, say thank you. Thank you, Appreciate it so much. Thanks so much, we appreciate it. When we send information out after this, we'll make sure y'all have their contact info if they consent to that. Um, websites, social media, all the juicy things um, so y'all can tap into their orgs. And I think we're about to go to break, uh, but I'm going to pass it back to our, oh yeah, yeah. We're going to go to break and we're going to come back at 35 after the hour. So thank you so much for being here and I'll see y'all soon. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you so much, panelists. Y'all were amazing. Listening to the people and what we care about. You were elected, and so it's your dereliction of duty bringing my cop.